Peace and blessings. How you doing? <clears throat> How you doing? I miss what you said. I'm, I'm going to do a biblical teaching on the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you. Amen. I am. Uh, let's give keep people a couple minutes to get on. <clears throat> and then uh, I'm going to go into it. Pray it be a blessing. Peace and blessings, how you doing? Peace and blessings. How you doing? Praise God. How you doing on the scope? What's up? Line upon line. Amen. What's up? What's up? Peace and blessings. Whoever just got on the conference call. God bless. How you doing? Free your people to go deeper in you. Yeah. Praise God. Take us deeper, Lord. In you, Lord. Give a place in you. My internet wilding right now. No respect. My internet had no respect. Everybody, <clears throat> peace and blessings. <clears throat> we get started in a couple minutes. Amen. Praise God. It's Brother Moses. Thank you guys for just taking a moment to get in the scope for me. Peace and blessings, beloved. I was going to give you a call after the scope, you know. <clears throat> um, 
Brother Moses here. I'm glad you guys are taking the time to get on the school with me. Pray you're having a great day. Pray you're still holding on to the hem of the garment of Jesus. Pray your faith is still in God. Pray that your heart is not troubled. In spite of what you're going through, God is able. God is able. Um, <clears throat> my lesson today is going to be on the blood of Jesus. On the blood of Jesus. Now, this is a common thing that us as believers, you know, we we plead the blood. Peace and blessings. How you doing? Welcome to the scope. We plead the blood of Jesus, and we say these. We say this religious jargon that we heard over and over. Maybe your grandmother, maybe your auntie, maybe your uncle in prayer. Maybe you heard it at church. You know, we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus. And oftentimes we just repeat it, this religion. Uh, how is there power in the blood? What is this and how it is applied to us today, God? We pray that through it, Father, that the precious promises of one heart and one mind, God, united with you, with your will, with your agenda, ask that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking, that you would anoint our eyes with eyes, so that they may see, that you would prepare our heart, Father, to receive, Father, on good soil, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what I want to start with, I wanna, I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, that might be touched, and that burnt with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words. Which voice they that heard and treated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. He's talking about when the people came before God in Moses' day and God met them on a mountain. <clears throat> but they could not endure that which was commanded. And if, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are coming to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Verse 24, we've come to who? To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Praise God. So I want to talk to you about the power of the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> For me to give understanding about this. Um, I just got to break down a couple things of why blood is important. Why is blood so significant in the Bible? What is so significant about the blood of Jesus? Why did he have to give blood? You know, <clears throat> well, uh, the answer of that is that it's in Leviticus 17.11. Le Come here, lads. Go get lads. Why did you leave him in the room by himself? Leviticus 17, 11 says this. And my son. Come here, son. What's up? I don't know. You don't know? No. Okay, my son. Amen. You want to say hi to the people on Scope? Hi. Hi, peace and blessings, beloved. <laughs> it's my daughter, Gracie. You want to say hi? Hey. Okay, you just sit with daddy. Okay, 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Okay? So the life of the flesh is the blood, and God said, I've given it for an atonement or a, 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 a payment for your sins or for your debts. So we know in the beginning God said that we should not, the man that eateth of this tree or the man that goes against his law will surely die. We know in Romans it says that the wages of sin is what? Death. But God does not desire for us to die in any fashion. Death as in separation from him. Death as in the end of life. Death as in the end, uh, separated from all living. Death as in isolation, death as in ceasing from functioning your purpose. Whatever definition that you have in death, it is not God's desire for us to experience any of it. So when God made a law that whoever sinned, the wage of your sin or the consequence of your sin is death. You know, all of us have sinned, but yet God didn't desire, desire for any of us to die. So because God is righteous and his judgments and his act. What he did was he made a way to fulfill that that payment, that um, that debt without us actually dying. Now, the Bible says that um, when God talked about equal judgment, he said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a life for a life. So God was saying that uh, if somebody pluck your eye, pl if somebody take your eye out, then you take their eye out. Also, that's equal. That's justice. That's the appropriate payment for what was done. So if someone takes a life, then the appropriate payment for that life is their life. Okay? So God said if a person sinned, then the wage of that sin is death. So the debt to cover your sin is you giving your life. You giving your life. And we know that the life the blood is the life of the flesh. The blood is the life of the flesh. So that's why, you know, God allowed there to be a substitute. God allowed there to be a substitute instead of you giving your life, you know, to pay the price for your death. I mean, to pay the price for your sin. What God did was he allowed an animal to take your place to fulfill the debt, but yet still allow you to live. So that's why you have grace and mercy. He provides a substitute to take your place. And the mercy is you don't have to pay that penalty yourself. So when they would lay these animals or these sacrifices before God, they would cut the animal's neck and let the animal bleed out. And they would take the, the blood that's actually the offering before God. God didn't want the animal. He wanted the blood, which was the life. Because that was the debt for the sin. You had to give your life up. So we give the life or the blood of an animal. This is why the blood is significant because the blood is the life of the flesh. The blood represents life. The blood represents life. Okay. So, you know, they would have to, um, during certain seasons and dur during certain times, they would have to give offerings. They would have to give animals consistently for different, for different sin offerings. But once a year, they have something called atonement. Okay? This is Leviticus 16. Okay? This is Leviticus 16. Let me see if I can read it in a clearer version than the King James. Because the King James version just is going to bore you probably. It's a blessing though. Okay? Bro, you sleep? This boy sleep. Leviticus 16 says this. <clears throat> Let me see how much I should read. All right. Uh, let me go. All right. This Leviticus 16, and I'm probably just going to read about 10 verses, maybe 12 verses. And Jehovah spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before Jehovah and died. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil, before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Herewith shall Aaron come into the holy place, 
with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put on, on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen bre breeches upon his flesh <laughs> and shall be girded with the linen girdle. And with the linen mitri shall he be attired. They are the holy garments, and he shall bathe his flesh in water and put them on. So this is the ritual that God is teaching the priests, namely Aaron, when he did the sacrifices, that he would have to change garments, cleanse himself, wash himself. It's a little ritual that they had to go through. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two he goats for a sin offering. Now he's going to take two goats and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall present the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself, okay, and for his house. And he shall take the two, atonement means like basically a payment of debt. And, and ye shall, it means more than that, but that's what we're going to go for right now. And ye shall take the two goats and set them before Jehovah at the door of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. One lot for Jehovah and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat upon which, which the lot fell for Jehovah and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be set alive before Jehovah to make atonement for him, to send him away for Azazel in the wilderness. Azazel, I guess that's supposed to be Israel. Hold on. Because I never read that. From off the altar before Jehovah and his hands full of sweet incense before upon the fire before Jehovah, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat on the east. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. That is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with his blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat before the mercy seat. He shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions, even all their sins. So shall he do for the tent of meeting that dwelleth with them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tent of meeting when he goeth in, in to make atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of God. Okay? Alright, so it just goes on and on. Verse 18, he lays the he put blood on the altar. He put blood on everything. He was instructed by God to sprinkle the blood on everything. Verse 19, he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it. So listen, and he will sprinkle the blood seven times and what? And cleanse it and hollow it or make it holy from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he had made an end of atoning for, I'm going to break, I'm just reading it so you have a scriptural reference, but I'm going to break it down. And when he had made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, even all their sins, and he shall put them upon the head of the goat, and shall... Uh, he had two animals, with the priest, which is Aaron, what he would do is, he would kill one animal, and take the blood of that animal, and sprinkle it on animals or tools or instruments that are used for the ministry of God. He sprinkled it on everything. Right? And the Bible says that he did this to cleanse these things. And to hollow them or to set them apart as being holy or pure. To cleanse them from all the uncleanness of the people. So he, the priest... Sprinkle the blood or apply the blood of an animal to cleanse everything that was supposed to be for God and to set it apart for the purpose of God. Then he took, it was two goats. Remember, he killed one and the other one alive. He would basically, he would take the blood of that goat 
that was killed, he would confess or he would speak all the sins of Israel on this one, a goat that's alive. It's called the scapegoat. Then he will apply the blood there. Then he will pronounce a blessing. The blessing that he will pronounce is Psalms 103. Psalms 103. When it says, bless the Lord, all my, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, all my soul, who what? Forgives me of all my sins and heals me of all my, uh, of my um, diseases. And forgives me of all my iniquities and separates me as far as my separates me from my sins as far as the east is from the west. See, when David quoted that, David was coming into remembrance of the um, the blessing that the priest would pronounce on the Day of Atonement. Hold on. Here, yeah, lay down, son. Did you see that? Okay. So this is the, they would pronounce a blessing. They would apply the blood to clean everything and to set things apart. The priest would do this to set things apart for the purpose of God. Okay. This was the purpose. Now this was done prophetically, you know, because the, we know that the blood of animals could not, you know, take away our sins. But it was a, a type and a shadow of what Jesus would ultimately fulfill. So until Jesus came, they would have to do this year by year, season by season to cover their sins, like to make a sin offering for their sins. OK. Now, I wanted to give you the backdrop of that, because this is where this is where the revelation of applying the blood of Jesus to something. Because we know that Jesus is the atonement. We know that Jesus is the fulfillment of this law that was in the old covenant. We know that Jesus fulfilled that so that we no longer have to bring um, goats, he goats and lambs and off sin offerings to service every week. So we just acknowledge that Jesus is this sin offering. Jesus is the one that shed his blood for our own sins. And we know that it's because of his blood that our sins is forgiven. Okay? So, I'm going to go into some things. But, so when we pray, now, now the, remember, the Bible says that the priest had the responsibility to sprinkle the blood to cleanse everything from sin. Now it says this in Revelation. Revelations chapter 1 says this. Four through six. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests. Unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Jesus, you know, he, he is our high priest. When he died. He actually took his own blood and offered it in the temple in heaven. Okay, that's another whole teaching. But he said, Mary, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. Because he was the priest that offered up his own blood before the, in the temple of heaven. Just like Aaron did as a priest had to offer it up in the temple. Okay, that's why when you read in Revelation, the Bible says that John, when he went to heaven, he seen the lamb slain, you know, in heaven. Because Jesus had to offer his own blood. But now because of that, the Bible says that Jesus has made us, every single believer, a king and a priest. Every single believer, Jesus has made a priest unto himself. So that means that every single believer has the authority to do a priestly duty before Jesus. Now, in the Old Covenant, we know in the natural, 
there was only certain people that had been chosen to be priests, Aaron and all of his sons. Moses, Aaron, and all of Aaron's sons are, were chosen to be priests. But in Jesus, all of us have been chosen to be priests unto him. And therefore, all of us can do a priestly duty before God. 